You okay? Oh, yeah. Are you Tony Stank? Yes, this is this is Tony Stank. You're in the right place. Thank you for that. Never dropping that, by the way. Table for one, Mr. Stank. Please, by the bathroom. <laughs> Welcome, true believers, into a very special uh, tribute episode of the Rebel Radio Podcast. Yes. Uh, not the kind of tribute that you would necessarily want to do, but one that you should do because, of course, the world knows by now that we lost Stan Lee on Monday. He was 95 years old. And, um, you know, it, but we're not necessarily mourning as much as we're celebrating. Yeah. Because he lived a long, very fulfilled life, um, did some amazing, amazing things. And, um, Without him, we might not be here podcasting today. Absolutely, uh, especially talking about things we talk. Maybe we'd, you know, maybe we'd have had a different idea of what we were going to podcast about. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'd, we'd, we would one of these hundreds of true crime podcasts or something. But oh, yeah. but yeah. we are very <laughs> movies and comic focused, and and uh, Stan Lee is the reason for a lot of that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we felt like we owed him an episode just dedicated to him, and um, and talk about his legacy and the things that he's he brought to us and uh, the characters you created, and um, what he means to us overall. And uh, so I guess we'll start talking a little bit about what he means to us. And uh, for me, obviously, you know, I grew up, my earliest memories reading comic books and watching uh, animated series. Like, you know, I remember Super Friends, Friends, which is, of course, DC, but I also remember the old Spider-Man and Fantastic Four cartoons. Oh, yeah. Stan Lee would always narrate the beginning of them. And... uh, and that was always like I knew this voice of Marvel, and I knew what he looked like. <laughs> but at that age, I wasn't aware of what he meant to the world. I had no idea. This, I just knew he worked for Marvel. Yeah. I didn't know he created all he these existed. wonderful characters, <laughs> yeah. and it helped shape my childhood in a lot of ways to fall in love with these characters and these world of superheroes, as much as George Lucas did for Star Wars. So for me, as much as my parents made me into the person I am. Stanley had a lot to do with it and the things I'm into. Yeah, I think I think Stanley uh my first just experience kind of just, you know, knowing Stanley and and you know realizing his existence was watching the Simpsons back in the day whenever he did the episode I am furious yellow and uh you know I mean I know he did some other cameos too where he walked I think it was the same one where he walked into the uh the comic book shop but um that's whenever you know Homer gets all mad and he he uh, he thinks he's the Hulk, and then you know Stan. He you know he has the he does the voice acting, and he's like, "No, I'm the Hulk," and he's trying to Hulk out, but he can't Hulk out, and he's like, "Ah," <laughs> but uh, you know that's that's r- probably really the you know first time I really you know found out that that was you know who who was behind you know Spider Man uh, the Spider Man cartoons that that I liked. Um, you know we I think we we would see it on like a boomerang kind of right. show. Uh, because we're just a little younger than you, so yeah. a bit. And, yeah. and then he would always appear on these documentaries and narrating yeah. things about comic books and Marvel, and and you knew that this guy was important as a kid, but you didn't quite know the importance. You did not realize it. And, and all the credit in the world to Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, who helped create a lot of these characters too. But it was Stan's imagination that gave us Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, Daredevil, Black Panther, the Hulk. Iron Man, yeah, you know, Thor. about Thor, about the only carry, you know, Jack Kirby was Captain America was a Jack Kirby creation. A lot of people don't know that, but, but yet Stan was able to bring him into the Avengers, him and Jack and bring Captain America into the Marvel world at that time, back in the sixties. And so, and this is what this guy has given the world. And then obviously today it's huge. Can we still, comic book movies are filling up theaters. They're filling up aisles at targets and Walmarts and, Toy Wars with yeah. toys and comics and Marvel is as big as it ever has been. Yeah, and and we owe all that to Stan Lee and for his vision of make of entertaining the world and and staying with it even whenever you know Marvel movies weren't really super successful. Um, you know, back whenever you know we first started getting them in. I mean, you know, you remember you know like you know seeing all of his cameos 
Um, you know, like his cameo in Mallrats was cool. Well, you can but, go back even before yeah. that. They had a Spider-Man movie in 1977, which was a movie pilot to the television series star Nicholas Hammond. And we're going to talk some Spider-Man movies Nicholas here in a little Hammond. bit because Spider-Man is uh, was Stan Lee's one of his favorite characters. And, um, and that played in theaters, but it wasn't successful because comic books were kind of a joke at the time. There was something teenagers yeah. read. No one thought to go to movie theaters until um, Superman the movie came out, and it took comic books a little more serious. When the Spider-Man movie hit theaters, it's like, what is this? Yeah, and then, uh, of course, his his cameos in the Spider-Man movies are very iconic, Being uh, showing up once even as a mentor to... You know, for a moment in, right. in Spider-Man. You know, one man can make a difference. And, and we're going to talk his cameos more here in a minute. Um, do you have a favorite? I don't remember the first year you were able to go to Compalooza. Were you at any of the ones where Stan was there? I was at one. It was the I think it was the first one that I was able to go to. It was 2015. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because he was there in 14 and 15. Yeah, and that was that was the one with the, the huge panel that we couldn't even get in. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't even bother going. I think Frank was able to sneak in somehow mm-hmm. and, and he used his press pass i think i think we tried to get in and they're like oh we we don't care if you have a press pass you have to go to the back of the right. line and so we're like man we can't can't even get in can't even see this guy and uh frank got a couple good shots that that year of uh credit to credit to the frank do you have a uh, so being at compalooza or any other time do you have a favorite like stanley memory other than your early memories like the one that stands out to you that you're always going to remember him for um, I would probably say um, the time that he was on uh, co- uh, Comic Book Men, and he's talking about they, – they asked him about, you know, who would win, Hulk or Thor? Because that's, you know, that's a question that everyone, you know, would like to know. Mm-hmm. And Stan Lee is the only person that could ever answer that. And so he said, uh, you know, you would hope that it – he's like, as a creator, you feel like you're their father. And you would hope that it would end in a draw. Right. And so that's – what his answer was it would end in a draw um i mean i was lucky enough to have a couple of personal memories i was um at compliza 2014 the yeah. first year I was there and um, a friend of mine carrie gordon you know a friend of ours he asked me to stand in line for him to get something signed because he was doing some work and and carrie came back over there and, and he was like well you can go now and i i said no i'll stay and i decided to stay and, and hang out with carrie while he got his picture signed by stan and i was able to shake stan's hand oh wow so that was a good moment and then that same year I was able to attend his panel and just hearing him talk about comics and everything was just, you know, it's, it's just hearing magic come out. I mean, I would put this man up there with Walt Disney as far as yeah his legacy. And that's a good comparison. That same year, we, me and Frank were at the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. panel, and he crashed the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. panel with Lou Ferrigno. Oh, man. He came out there and, and gave them all high fives and said some jokes, and uh, that was a really, really neat moment that year at Compalooza. So those are a couple of favorite moments because I was able to witness those and, and see those for me, for Stanley. And um, so as far as his cameos, I guess we can go into that because, you know, those are some favorite moments. He's really known for his cameos. And there's a lot, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people out there in the world that only know Stanley. It's like, that's the guy that's that the dude. cameos in all the Marvel movies. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he's so much more than that. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of that on the internet the last couple of days of people just talking about the cameos they like and, and what, what they remember him for. And, but in, and obviously for us that are really into this, we know it's so much more than that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I do have some favorite cameos. Um, I I really like one of those more recent ones. I like the Tony Stank cameo in Civil oh, War. Oh heck yeah! I think that's really funny. It shows Stan's sense of humor, and uh, you know, and it's hilarious. And, and it's a it's a funny you know just what happened prior to that scene. We needed some humor, uh-huh. and Stan really delivers yeah. on the humor. I think and, it is a perfectly good reason the timing of it after Steve and Tony are at odds, and 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 Tony is is a uh, emotionally not broken but emotionally torn apart is what just happened with civil war and then yeah. stan just comes in delivers this really funny line towards the end of the movie well is this for tony stank <laughs> uh, uh what's one cameo that stands out to you um i would i'm gonna go like very simple um the first iron man whenever he's getting off the plane he's like hey hef and he pats you know him <laughs> right. on the back and he turns around yeah. and he's in, he looks like friggin hugh hefner in that red <laughs> robe and i just thought that was really hilarious even though it's very simple yeah. and it's uh playing off of you know tony stark's uh character uh just his, his personality um and j- just the timing and you know it's it's pretty funny 
Yeah. Way funnier than the Larry King cameo. Right. And then he's had a couple of, like, I, I thought the Deadpool one where he was a strip club DJ was funny because, yeah. you know, Stan was never afraid to make fun of himself. And I like the, um, the, he had some good ones in Spider Man. Really, the amazing Spider Man, even if those movies weren't well received, when he's the music teacher and Lizard and Spider Man are fighting in the background, it's a really cool cam- yeah. uh, uh, cameo. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. And uh, then. And of course, you mentioned earlier this, the Spider-Man Three cameo might be the most iconic because of what he says to Peter Parker in the movie, at, in Spider-Man Three. Like, really, one man really can make a difference. Yeah, you know? and it's like Pete. Pete's looking for some direction there, and and it's like Stan Lee's giving him that direction. Mm-hmm. And it might be the least well received of the Spider-Man movies, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But that cameo might be top three as the best ones. Yeah, and. Um, any others? That- I, I really, I do like the one in Thor Ragnarok. Whenever he's going to give Thor the his barber, haircut. yeah, that's actually a good one. Yeah. Stay still. <laughs> My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. <laughs> and he probably really couldn't <laughs> see shit at that point. Yeah, he's even admitted in, in his, uh, you know, it in his uh, interviews. He's like, yeah, people interview me. I can't see them. Uh, sometimes I can't tell what they're saying, but I do my best. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you're a trooper. Yeah, or even, yeah. I remember at the panel at Comic Palooza 2014. Um, his his wife Joan, Joan was still alive then, and she was at the panel with him and his handler, and they repeated a lot of things to him because he couldn't even hear then in yeah. 14 real well with a microphone. So who knows if he saw the crowds? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. And uh, but no, and, and and apparently you know he's people will say oh there's no more cameos, but apparently he did film a few ahead of time. Um, we don't know which. I would imagine he's had to have filmed his cameos for Captain Marvel and Avengers four at this point. Um, I know. I heard, I heard Guardians. Yeah, three. I know James Gunn. Well, James Gunn said he shot a cameo. Um, will it be used? You would think it would be used, regardless of Gunn not being the yeah. director of uh, Guardians three. Uh, and who knows what else he shot? You know, the the new X Men movies are already uh, done and coming out next year. Yeah. So possibly that was shot already. And uh, so I think we'll have a few more Stanley cameos on the way. Got and, to. Uh, and it, it's kind of like uh, like remember whenever Chris Farley died and he and there was like a few movies that showed up. Right. With him in it after he died. Yeah. And it was, it's well, going to be shot a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and then in Marvel, you still have the animation world. You know, hopefully, you know, he could appear in things like that. Cause yeah. I, I think Reuse Stan, the voice. Yeah. Stan will always live on in some ways. We'll always have the movies and the cameos and the animation stuff he's done with the narrations and things like that. So it'll always continue to have Stan Lee in some form on um, television and the movies. Yeah. I saw I saw one uh, picture. You know, of course, all these pictures are showing up with either, you know, him being you know lowered into the ground or in a in a viewing. And, but they had one where he's being hugged by a bunch of his own creations, and one of one of the characters he's being hugged by is Stripperella, huh. a very underwhelming, uh, you know, project that he had with MTV uh, to make uh, Pamela Anderson uh, voice right. an animated uh, stripper superhero. Yeah. Uh, Good concept. Um, I just think the villain sucked, and that's why right. it, it didn't do so good. Well, and a lot of people don't realize, you know, he hasn't officially worked for Marvel since, like, 1979. He stayed on as a consultant till like, 1990, and then when Marvel started having um, some bankruptcy issues, yeah, they had the success of X-Men number one and Spider-Man number one, mm-hmm. but he just was a character. He was more of just a face for the, for the company for a while, and he still remained that until... You know, he passed away a couple yeah. of days ago. He was more of a face of Marvel. He would do charity events and things like that. But um, there was a time where there was some bad blood between him and Marvel, and but yet he always stayed on as a special contracts person for the company and would still do cameos and voices. And then in the later years, Marvel took good care of him, giving him executive producer care credits on movies and doing all these cameos and things like that. Yeah. Because uh, and especially once Disney bought the company, they really realized the value of Stan Lee and to keep him around as of a face for this amazing world he created. Yeah, and really it's like you wonder how, you know, some of these universes were, you know, were created like Disney. Um, you know, this is very much like Disney except with superheroes um and it's a very intricate universe that he's created and you just wonder how, you know, he got that idea. Yeah. I want I wonder I wonder how how someone got to there. You wonder well, that about a lot of things, but something well, as big as and then, Marvel. And a lot of his characters yeah. he created, he always wanted his characters to be relatable. Where DC is ruled known as That's the right. cosmic and superpowers and things like that. He wanted you to relate to Peter Parker, that you could be a teenager that had troubles. You struggled in school, you struggled with girlfriends, you struggled you know, he had lost his uncle Ben, people as close to him, he didn't know who his parents were. 
and you he wanted you to relate to him to believe that you could go through these things too. Yeah, and and that's that was one of the big drivers of of the X Men. Why X Men was so popular because yeah. they were all outsiders, especially during the civil rights movements and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they had their own powers, but then they had problems at home. They had mm -hmm. social problems, um, you know, barriers that they had to overcome, you know, with, with civilization. And, uh, you know, that, that connected with a lot of people. Yeah, and then, obviously, Jack Kirby created Captain America coming out of World War II to give people a hero. The Hulk was two sides of Stan Lee. It was his good side, smart side, and he admitted that the Hulk was sometimes his angry side when he didn't know how to let go of things. So he created the Hulk to deal with that. And... Um, Iron Man was, you know, how how does a Playboy deal with also trying to help the world and things like yeah. that, and um, oh, and Black Panther, which it was an incredible character to be created at that time in the world, and to create the first black superhero to give, you know, young black kids something to look up to, and then and look what it became. We just had one of the biggest comic book movies ever of all time come out this year yeah. when Black Panther hit theaters, and now you have children that are able to play with Black Panther action figures and dress as, as um, T'Challa and and little girls play like Cherie in the movie and it's phenomenal that he thought of that in the 60s to say hey and, and Stan always stood up for that he always stood against bigotry and racism and he always believed that people of all races colors and genders were equal and that comics were everybody and he was there to entertain everyone yes and that these characters you know, didn't belong to one person. They belonged to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you know, he did a really good job of making his stories relatable and, you know, and something entertaining that you can instantly connect to. And I think everyone has connected with, with every yeah. superhero that he really created, at least the ones on screen. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as far as the other ones, like, I don't know, like Squirrel Girl, I guess we'll never get a, a Squirrel right. Girl cameo with, with Stan Lee now. Right. Do you have any favorite... Your boy, who's your favorite Stan Lee creation? If you had to pick one, if I had to pick my favorite Marvel creation from Stan Lee, it I guess it would have to be Spider Man. Yeah, because it, it, he's just I mean he's, he's even like, the bad Spider Man movies are fun to watch. Yeah, he's iconic, and uh, and, and our grandmothers know who Spider Man is, and, yeah. and our uncles and people across the world. And um, if I had to pick a Dark Horse favorite, it would be Daredevil. Yeah, I, I really like the character of Daredevil. Obviously, the Avengers are super well known now because of the films that came out. But there was a time, maybe ten years ago, the Avengers weren't as well known to the whole world. But now, the thanks to, to the um, thanks to cinema, people around the world know who the Avengers are. And uh, but I think Spider Man is easily probably his greatest creation. And I know he was real. He was a big fan. He was always very proud of Spider Man and the Hulk. He felt like those were the two. That were him the most. Spider Man as a teenager, the Hulk as an adult, and he always said that. And that, sh and that, and he should be, you know, because we had Blade and we had X Men, and that started, you know, our our Marvel universe. But Spider Man showed us that, you know, you could have a blockbuster, that that you could, you know, you could take Spider, you know, a character and put him on screen, and it could be really successful, and the audience could fall in love with it, and it could be huge. Yeah. And uh, I I credit Spider, you know, Sam Raimi Spider Man one. Um, you know, in 2001 with, you 2002. know, 2002, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with, you know, what we have today, I yeah. think without that movie, we don't have this. And, and on the Rebel Radio podcast, you know, we always have a featured movie and, and we're not so much a featured movie today, but we wanted to talk about the Spider-Man films because they are, I think, what is, I think X-Men helped kind of jumpstart it in 2000, but the Spider-Man yeah. films are absolutely what took it over the edge and allowed for Fox to make the Fantastic Four movies, even if they weren't well received, yeah, and it eventually led to Paramount making Iron Man and forming Marvel Studios, uh, and taking chances. And obviously, Sony and Columbia Pictures made the Spider-Man films, but Paramount saw the value to take a chance at um, doing another film. And Spider-Man was a long path to get to the big screen, almost 25 years. Um, James Cameron was working on Spider-Man back in the 80s. I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and Cameron really wanted to make a Spider-Man film. Carlico Pictures and Canon Films owned the rights to Spider-Man at one point when James Cameron had made The Terminator, and he even wrote a script for it and everything. And um, and so it took a long time to get to come to screen, and there are elements of the script from James Cameron's script that are in the Spider-Man film that we did finally get. Um, like the whole ideas of 
Spider-Man sitting up at the Twin Towers. Some of that was from Cameron's script. And that's why the original poster had it. But then they weren't able to use the Twin Towers, obviously, because of what happened with 9-11. Yeah, they had to edit them out uh, of, of the of the cuts. I remember that because we were supposed to get Spider-Man earlier. But then I remember he got pushed back because of the uh, the cuts and the edits that they had to do because yeah. of the, t- the Twin Towers. They didn't right. run it uh, in there, which, uh, you know, I, th- I think now... Maybe they should have kept it in there. Yeah, and and we would have had a you know a superhero movie with the uh, with the twin towers in it. That would have been really cool to remember. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, because I think there was an idea at one point where they had talked about filming some segments that took place around it, but but a lot of the filming was done I think before nine eleven happened. But I guess um, they ended up not using those ideas in the script. They just had them on the posters, mm-hmm. if I remember reading right. And then we got the film that we did get. And um, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is actually a really good movie. Uh, it's, I like two better, but I think yeah. his first film was was well done. You know, people are always going to argue that Toby was a little too old to be a high school student, and Christian Dunst is a little flat as Mary Jane. But overall, I think the film does a lot of things right. Yeah, I mean, if if you if you can take anything from Sam Raimi's films, um, I think that you know they really focused on Peter Parker as a person. I think I think they they really focused on on him, his struggles, his life, um, the things that he dealt with, uh, and you know I think we got a little bit of that in in Homecoming, and I think we're gonna get more. Um, so you know, not not to say that you know uh, Tom Holland's character doesn't show that, but right. I just feel like we got a lot a lot of Peter Parker in in hit the Sam Raimi Spider Man mm. films, and uh, if. You know, I, I don't. I don't know what you think. Uh, are you? Are we going to rank them from uh, from bottom to bottom? We are in a minute, yeah, I yeah. think. And I, uh, yeah, you know, and, and Raimi, you're right. He did a lot of things right. I think Toby got the idea of what Peter Parker was supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, some of the dialogue was well written. Some of the w- one liners that Spider Man delivered while he was fighting. Yeah. Uh, I think they that got was it, really good. I think they got it more right with Homecoming, but they got the idea started. Um, the villains were pretty well handled. Willem Dafoe was really good as Harry Osborn. Excellent. Um, not sure about the Green Goblin costume. It's kind of very, it's, it's very late nineties ish, early two thousand. Yeah, it's costume. very. It shows its um, age. Yeah, for but sure. Then, but then we get to Spider Man Two. Alfred Molina is unbelievable. Ooh, excuse me, unbelievable as Doc Ock. He absolutely, is absolutely phenomenal. And and I think one thing that made uh, Molina really good his depiction of Doc Ock is because they developed this. This was like the first comic book villain we mm. saw developed. And he had like a big backstory. Right. Um, he he had a tragic ending and a tragic beginning. Yeah. And uh, and, and you could really relate to to Doc Ock. And, and I still think that Molina's Oc, Doc Ock is still one of the best Marvel villains we've had on screen, even against the stuff that Marvel Studios has done. He just he did such a great job with that character that if he's not too old, I would almost love to see him come back and do it again. Yeah, he could come you back. Know? Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then they moved on to Spider Man Three, which. Ramey fought with the studio. He didn't want to put Venom in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Hayden Church does a good job as Sandman. A lot of that's handled right, but the Venom stuff we know is kind of atrociously done. They throw Gwen Stacy in the movie, and, you know, she's like, why is she there? Yeah, why is she there? (laughs) And uh, Spider-Man 3 became a mess, and then Ramey wanted to come around and do a part four, um, but he wanted to do it his way, and again, the studio kept interfering uh, Toby Maguire, even he had enough of the studio, studio interfering, and they just all walked away. Yeah. So you know what? We're not going to do Spider-Man 4. And then they went on to make the Amazing Spider-Man films, which were done with uh, Andrew Garfield. And they're okay. The second one's not very good. No, um, it's it's pretty much a mess. Yeah. I mean, you don't know what the story's trying to develop, really, with the second one. And that's the problem. If they would have just focused on one plot, um, you know, it, like you have, you have, you know, if, if Peter Parker's parents were killed. Why are they right. killed? And then you have uh, Osborne. You know his father's dying, and he's got this disease. He turns into a monster. Then you got the Rhino, right. and then weird. you got Electro, and then. But it's... the first one is arguably okay. The lizards handle really well. Um, yeah. Stuff with Gwen Stacy's father and everything, and it does have. Um, oh, I'm gonna forget her name. Gwen Stacy. Uh, yeah, the yeah. actress. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, Emma Stone. Emma Stone. You know, and she's yeah. always adorable in a film. And Andrew Garfield, for what he has to work with in the movies, I think he does okay. I think they he's have really good chemistry. Too, he's just a little yeah. too old. He's a little skaterish to uh Yeah, he's, he, when he was you know, skating he's to, nerdy, uh, to Coldplay in the movie. Yeah, yeah. He's not the nerdy, awkward Peter Parker that you get. And, then we and he's kind of smug. Yeah. Yeah. And then we moved to Homecoming, where Marvel was finally able to get Sony to say, hey, let us do this for you. Let's reboot it. Sony, let, let us borrow the character. 
and they introduce him in Civil War, and it's it's a brief ten minutes, but it's fantastic. And then he gets his own movie in Homecoming, which is arguably the Spider-Man movie we've been waiting for for sixty years. And, yeah, and Homecoming is really really good. It might be one of my it, it might not be the best Marvel Studios movies, but it might be one of my favorites because I really enjoy the heck out of it. Oh yeah, and everything we and, got uh, we got a Spider-Man on on you know film that we. You know, we had been waiting for it for a long time. A younger Spider-Man, um, and Tom Holland just absolutely yeah, Tom nails Holland it. Nails it. Yeah. And uh, so that being said, uh, let's rank the Spider-Man film. Heck yeah! Let's what's rank the, this. What's the What's the worst one? Sp- Amazing Spider-Man two. I, I would agree. I think it's the I think it's the worst of the bunch. And and it's not because Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone don't try. It's not even that Jamie Foxx doesn't try. It's just not a very good plot. It's just not very good ideas. Yeah. It's not executed well. The best parts about it um i think the the best part that makes it watchable watchable is the uh, the web slinging mm-hmm. there's a lot of cool web slinging in that in that film um and, you know even the uh the electrocution of his web slingers that's pretty cool um and you know even emma stone uh you know her her speech i really like that yeah. at the end but it's just such a mess with and the, the, plot. the kid who plays green goblin is terrible horrible He's dude a very bad actor um What's the next on the list of the films? I have a feeling we might differ here. Yeah, I, I, I knew we were going to agree on, on the worst, but uh, I, I want to say the uh, the predecessor to that film is the next one for me. Um, I do like that film a lot. Uh, I felt like they did not um, do a really good job of developing Doc Connors uh. and just having him you know, shoot a laser into the sky. There's a really cool scene. I really like the fight scenes, and I feel like it does you know, a pretty good job you know, kind of trying to stay with the comics i really like that they came out of the gate with the with the lizard being the bad guy yeah. um and it, it is a really good film and you know 50 days uh 50 summer nights the the actor that did that or the director that did that film directed this one and that's why the chemistry yeah. um you know between andrew garfield and emma stone is so good there's a lot of really good elements to it i just have to put it you know second to the bottom not See, that it's bad i'm but, i'm really on the fence on this but i gotta put spider-man 3 there just because it's just the last 40, 30, 40 minutes. If if those last 30, when he starts dancing and doing the emo thing, and, I, and I've always, people dancing in movies yeah. to their own music and the other people in the movie don't hear the music always bugs me in any film. If it's a musical, okay, you accept it. But when Tobey Maguire, Peter Parker, is walking down the street and he hears music and he's dancing to it and people are looking at him like, what are you dancing for? It makes no sense in the continuity of a film. Yeah. Because no one else is hearing this music except the audience and I guess Peter Parker in his head. Those kind of scenes bug me and that's where the movie started to lose it for me. It was that moment in the movie. I'm just like, wow, this is stupid. <laughs> and um, But I like the first part of the film with Sam Man. Yeah. Um, not a big fan of Topher Grace. I never bought him as Eddie Brock. I just was nope. like... I mean, Topher Grace is the kind of kid that you'd probably punch in high school because he was a dork. Yeah. Eddie Brock is supposed to be big and tough. Um, so that's... I don't have a lot more to say. I have a feeling that's your next on the list. Yeah, yeah, that is my next on the list. I mean, the reason I put it higher is because, man, it gave us so many memes and gifts. <laughs> you trash, Brock. And then, it no, I think it makes fun of itself. And, and that's why I love the, the crazy dancing scenes. And then there's the scenes with... Uh, um, you know the uh, the secretary, and he's like, you know, maybe I can shoot you one time, and then uh, you know he comes. That's not what I pay you for. <laughs> and right. and uh, there's there's just a lot of funny funniness in uh, in how that's transpired. And, and it does have some great J. Jonah Jameson moments. It yeah. was fantastic throughout all three of them. I do feel that. And that's one thing I felt was missing in yeah. Amazing Spider Man was was no J., J., J. Jonah Jameson. I felt what was missing was the the Hobgoblin. I mean, I felt like, you know, he's just on the back burner this whole time, even though, you know, he bonks his head and he's he's affluent yeah, through the film. So and this is Franco before he had done any, like, really good movies, so his yeah. acting is kind of, eh, in it, yeah, you know. Yeah, he, he's definitely, uh, you know, still at the stoner uh, actor caliber at that point. Um, but I felt like, you know, they really should have led with that. Um, as a, Obviously, as opposed to Venom, they should have saved that for another film. Yeah. And then the retcon... You know, having Sandman in there, I didn't mind it, 
But, you know, I thought Hobgoblin, having these two friends battle it out, right. Spider-Man 3, uh, would have been fine. And, of course, Kirsten Dunst is just bland as ever because <laughs> she's probably told, this, yeah, you're just going to get saved point, again. Right. And she's like, oh, great, I'm a damsel in distress <laughs> again. And so that's probably why she just looks like she lay, you know, trying to lay a turd the whole time. That next, I would put Amazing Spider-Man. I, I think it's a... I like moments of it a little better than Spider-Man 3 just because I like the lizard in it. And um, I think the ending scene's really cool where he's, New Yorkers are helping him and he's going through. And um, I, I just it, and I think from beginning in, it's a little more solid. It, it tells a better plot. It's not as loosely thrown together as the last 30 minutes of Spider-Man 3. And that's yeah. probably my only reason why. And then um, then if I have to ne- jump to the next one on the list is... Um, is the first the Sam Raimi Spider Man? You know that's going to be next. Yeah, right? that's the same for me. Which I think is a great introduction, and we talked about it a little bit already. Um, Defoe, yeah, yeah, Defoe, Toby. We get we get we get an origin of Spider Man on the screen. We get to see a costume. I'm still not sure to this day about the organic web shooters. I'm never sure what he was doing with that. It was you know, yeah, that felt like another '90s thing. Let's take this from the '90s and put it in the 2000s movie because it's weird and cool. Yeah, you know? and um, <laughs> so you know. Any, that's kind of, but I like the movie. Yeah, I mean, the Thanksgiving scene is really good. I mean, I think that's just where everything breaks in the movie. There's and, a lot of good quotes. The cunning warrior attacks neither yeah. body or mind. And Rosemary Harris <laughs> is fantastic as Aunt May. Yeah, uh, she she's is. So, she's so much better than Sally Field ever was, I think. And, and no no disrespect to Sally Field. She's a great actress. But Rosemary Harris was always the best. She, and, and Alyssa Milano... Um, no, is that who played Kirst- her now? Kirst- no, oh, in uh, the homecoming, uh, Marissa Tomei. Marissa Tomei. I mean, she's she's a very pretty lady, but she's still not the Aunt May I grew up with reading in comics. I grew up with Aunt May being the older grandma Aunt May, and that's why I think Rosemary Harris is so good. And in, then in the movies, let's talk about her spouse, Cliff Roberts. Yeah, I mean, you know the uh, yeah you know, rest in peace, Cliff Roberts. Um, you know, for someone who had such he a limited a role, to the film. he he did, and you, I think, when he dies, you really feel that Tobey Maguire's uh, character, you know, feels you know feels from that, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that's you know they did a really good job of you know emotionally of you know attaching you know attaching that to the film, so uh, you know that that's another element. I mean, giving him layers in such a short. Yeah. Uh, a short amount of time. And then, oh, Rand, Macho Man Randy Savage, oh, yeah. man. gets a cameo in it. I got you for 15 minutes. <laughs> right. 15 minutes Bruce Campbell. Or, well, Bruce Campbell always makes cameos in Sam yeah. Raimi films, so, so that's kind of a given. But, um, but yeah, it was, it's a good movie, and it still holds up well today. And um, and then I think next on the list, I don't know if we'll have the same, but and I, I've always I've gone back and forth with this. This will keep you up at night. I, I really, yeah. even after Homecoming came out, I still had this movie first. But now the more I've watched Homecoming... I've, this is backed up a little bit, and, but they're so neck and neck. And I have Spider Man Two at number at uh, my second favorite. We uh, we disagree on this one. I, I feel like Homecoming is is the next one for me. Um, I just I feel like it's going in the right direction, but um, you know it, I I feel like it didn't give me what what Spider Man Two gave me. And uh, you know Homecoming, we got some great shots. I mean, just. The way the action scenes, um, you know, the conflicts that Spider-Man goes through in that film, um, trying to balance work life and you know, well, work life, superhero life and school life, <laughs> and trying to do both. Um, I think it really is a reflection of some of the things he went through in the comics, and that was uh, one of the things that I I really liked about the film, other than just the great acting, it's got uh, the good it. villain, <laughs> and and you know, even introducing you know having a limited Iron Man in there. I know yeah. some people were like, why can't we just have Spider-Man in there? And that's it. But um, I think there was just enough Tony in there. And it, and, it, and then enough. once you see him. Infinity War, you understand why Tony's in it. Yeah, uh, especially that ending scene of Infinity War, you yeah. understand what it was all about. Um, yeah, it, and 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 I've gone back and forth with these. I really like them both a lot. But I, but I I I guess Homecoming's come to grow me, and I think Homecoming's really come to grow me more after Infinity War. And I see the importance of Stark's relationship with Peter Parker and everything, and. and and I just like Tom Holland so much in this movie. It's almost like I wish I could squeeze him and keep him like 21 years old <laughs> yeah. so we can get a whole lot more great Spider-Man movies over the years and him not grow too fast because yes. <laughs> he's so good as Peter Parker. Like whatever gymnasts do to stay 
young and not right. have puberty hit them, <laughs> have him do just have him do like gym gymnastics and stuff. So he yeah. stays the and, same age. And he just feels like a guy you'd want to hang out with. He just feels like, you know, just a cool, a guy. cool yeah. dude. And Especially with the pictures he took at Comic Palooza. Right. It looked like he was just having a good time. Yeah, man. Just a, a hometown kind of guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and that's kind of why I have Tom Holland. I, that's why I put Spider-Man Homecoming as my number one. So you have Spider-Man 2 as your number one. I have Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2 as my 2. number one. And I like and Spider-Man 2 a lot, man. Like, the train sequence is fantastic. All the Doc Ock battle sequences of this are really some of Sam Raimi's best shot action sequences. To, to me, it's more than that, though. Um, Spider-Man, <laughs> you know, is a burden on Tony. And, and we see this a lot in the comics. He's not able to have a love life. It causes danger for him. You know, and Mary Jane all the time. And and we see that through the film a lot. There's this conflict. There's this inner conflict. Mm-hmm. What's he supposed to do? Um, he doesn't... Then he, he doesn't want to care. Is this the one where he misses her play? He misses... Yeah, beginning? he misses yeah. her play. Um... Uh, I don't like the continuity. That whenever I first saw this film, I was like, "Okay, Jameson's son comes back from the moon. He's supposed to have the symbiote with him, and we're supposed to get a battle between the Shocker and the Rhino uh, to get whatever they retrieve from the moon." Um, but I, I cared less about continuity and just took this as a Spider-Man movie. And uh, continuity doesn't bother me as much, nearly as much anymore, uh, since I'm now more of a uh, Spider-Man nerd than a Spider-Man <laughs> snob, uh, so I, I just appreciate it for what it is. And he has this, you know, this internal battle. What's he supposed to do? Everyone needs a hero. Right. Everyone needs someone to look up to. And uh, you know, the, the kid that loves Spider-Man, Spider-Man, he Spider-Man, he almost quits too, yeah. being Spider-Man. And he, and you know what? He puts on the mask one more time. You know, and uh, and Doc Ock, of course, he falls into Doc Ock's trap. And uh, you know, he. You know, saves the people on the train. Like you said, the train scene is just really good. And, and they realize that, you know, Spider-Man's just a kid, you know, trying to, you know, trying to put the city on his shoulders. And uh, and then, of course, the ending scene when Doc Ock, you know, realizes that he's wrong and just takes down um, the, uh, the the nucleus of, of that. Um, uh, the device. Tri- yeah, yeah, I forget what. what a- some sort of fusion energy type yeah of fusion yeah. energy and and then of course you know him revealing himself to mary jane the 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 coffee scene the coffee the coffee house scene is really cool to me when he just senses it and he grabs her and, yeah. and jumps it. i mean that's just i i feel like there's so much peter parker they in there the there's spiders, so much inner they conflict the spider sense a lot more in the raimi films they, yeah they, they gradually introduced it in the in the holland film and and that's why i i felt like there's more in this movie. There's just more layers. Yeah. Not not that it's a, you know, you could argue if it's a, a better watchable film or enjoyable film, but you can't argue that this film has a, a lot more layers mm-hmm. than just trying to balance one life versus the other. Yeah. Um, this is whether you know this is selfishness. Um, you know, being being more than just a man, yeah. <laughs> you become legend, Mister Wayne. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's why I have it as as number one. So um, who's your favorite actor that plays Spider Man? Is it oh, is it Tom? I think it's got to be Tom Holland. Even after yeah. one film and a scene in Civil War, he just he nails it on so many levels. I mean, he just he gets how to do the one liners, the awkwardness, the scenes where he's awkward in front of uh, Zendaya's character and the uh, the other girl just yeah. comes across so well. He's got Ned, his nerdy friend, and, and you know. And it just it, it it works on so much. You know, to- Toby Maguire is like the girl that's just always been there. Yeah. You know, and, and you grew up with her, and you really appreciate her, and yeah. she was there. You know, whenever you were, you know, you were realizing yourself and what you liked, and then there's this new girl that comes along, and she's <laughs> exciting, but you really like that this person has been there through that time, and I feel like I. I you know, because of that, I have to seg- segregate it into who I like as Peter Parker <laughs> and who I like as, as Spider Man, and I, I have to say that I probably like uh, you know Tom Holland more as Peter Parker, and I like Tobey Maguire more as Spider Man just because he was there, yeah. and, and he's more uh, cognizant, you know. But I think. I think Tom Holland, you know, after another Spider-Man movie or two, he's probably going to sell me on yeah. it. We only got a few months to go yeah. until we get another one. Just a few more months, and then yeah. I'll have a different opinion, most likely. 
And then, of course, this this Christmas in just a few weeks, we have Spider Man into the Spider Verse, the animated oh, yeah. film coming from Sony, which looks really fun and exciting. I like and, this uh, older Spider Man. Yeah, you know, it looks kind of neat. We'll see how that works out. You Passing know, I, the torch. I really hope thing. it's successful because I'd like to see Marvel, and, and I know it's Sony doing it, but I'd like to see Marvel take a shot at some of this and see some more animated stuff and. And then we can maybe have more Stan Lee cameos in animated films. That know? would be cool. <coughs> I mean, no. Yeah, I'm, and Marvel definitely needs to step it up with yeah. their animation. I hope, I hope this is really good. Yeah. I hope this, I hope this works because I haven't seen much good from Marvel animation. Right, but you know, for for Stan Lee and his his characters, you know, he's he was so thrilled to finally have Spider Man. I remember re- when Spider Man came out in two thousand two. He was so excited for the world to finally get a proper Spider-Man film, and the same with the Hulk. And and unfortunately, the Hulk is tied to Universal Studios, and yeah. they don't want to release a solo Hulk film unless Marvel pays for all of it and all this. So, um, the uh, they let Marvel borrow the character for the Avengers, and maybe one day we'll get more Hulk films. But but I know no doubt that Stan is in heaven, so proud of everything he ever created, and his legacy is always going to live on. And and what do you think about? Oh, to the world, what what does his legacy mean to you and to the world? I I think, uh, you know, on our last movie we uh, we said, you know, Maximus Decimus Meridius said, uh, "What we do in life echoes in eternity." And I know it's a it's a cool quote, and we always you know smirk when we say it. But I think this is true. This is true in this situation. Yeah. I think that you know because of Stan Lee we're always going to have Marvel Marvel's always, always going to be relevant I mean, these characters will endure long after you and I have gone you oh, know yeah. uh, they are our, our grandkids and our great grandkids and our generations these characters will always be there because they have stood the test of time and they and, and he was so smart to create them as timeless characters that yeah. that can they can work in any era and that's why his characters are sort of relatable. You know, any any teenager from years now is going to relate to a teenager like Peter Parker because they're going to go through the same things. Yeah. They might have a little more technology at their hands. It might be the only difference. In Probably. <laughs> But they won't feel so bad about being a nerd. Right. Like, oh, you know what? Peter Parker was a nice guy <laughs> and a nerd. Yeah. And he was cool. And Exa- he still got exactly. the girl. And for, for me, it just means that, you know, I was able to grow up with wonderful characters that I could escape to. And and, and I'm not going to sit here and say I had some terrible childhood that I was depressed or anything, but but yet I was able to read comics and escape for a few minutes and, and grow up enjoying these characters, and they've made me excited for everything I'm into. I think without comic books and Star Wars, I might not have watched other science fiction movies and gotten into other characters and things like that. And, and um, it would allow me to open up a world of heroes and possibilities that I still enjoy today as an adult and my children are enjoying. Yeah, I mean, I, and that's that's another thing that's really cool, seeing something that you enjoyed, you know, growing up. My, my uncle is probably more, um, you know, gets gets the credit probably for introducing me to, you know, every, you know, pretty much every cool thing that I do right now um, or, or, you know, par- partake in. Right. And, and it's really cool awesome seeing my kids just you know and you you know like you said just liking the same thing getting into it you know jake sees a comic book shop and he wants to go into it uh we can't stop every single time but uh you know we i i try and get him something every once in a while and it's really cool to see you know kids take interest in it let's see waverly's over here trying to tell us what she thinks about stanley yeah (laughs) and everything hello (laughs) and uh but you know, and that is the thing. He's sta- it's going to stand the time. And Stanley has created these characters, just as Walt Disney did with his characters, and DC car- creators have done with theirs. That we will always have these characters now to forever love and enjoy, and we have Stan to thank for that. And yeah. um, you know, I was reading that you know, someone said that Kevin Smith brought him back in the mainstream because of Mallrats. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think no. he, you know, he. I don't think Stan ever went anywhere. He's always been there. It's uh, just. Uh, did he create the Stanley cameo? Maybe he did with Maybe. Mall Rats. You know, you can possible. argue that. Yeah, and, um, and I will say I think because I was in high school when Mall Rats came out, I think maybe seeing Mall Rats that Kevin did make me remember Stanley and not forget him because you know you go through a time in your life where you get busy in high school and college and you don't really pay attention as much. And I uh, and I think watching Mall Rats didn't remember. Oh man, this is the guy who created all this stuff. Yeah. So and um, and then. I think also watching it kind of, I had seen Clerks, 
but I hadn't really like thought much of it. So I, then when I saw Mallrats and Stanley, I'm like, wow, this guy likes comic books like I do. Yeah. It kind of made me a bigger Kevin Smith fan, I think, at the time. So And that's the thing that comic books and Stan Lee and these great creations do is they, they cross over to boundaries and they make you meet people everywhere. We go to Comic Blues and Comic Cons. And what does everyone have in common there? They probably like comics of some yeah. sort. You know, and or, you know, and that's that's a good point because with everything that goes on in the world, no matter what, you know, you know, you you like to debate about, no matter, you know, who you vote for, it's like there's something that we can come together and and we agree on and and we can talk about, you know, and be in harmony with, and that's Stanley yeah. Marvel Comics, and even DC Comics. Not trying, you know, not trying. Yeah, to, no, yeah, no. yeah, but. Especially, you know, Stanley and what Marvel has done as of as of late, and and what it's come to, and uh, his presence in it. Absolutely, yeah. and it's what he's given the world. And um, and any final thoughts on on Stan? I mean, I, I put on my Facebook, I put that, uh, you know, thank you, Stan. You know, you you've given us heroes in a world that needs heroes every day. Yeah. From and and, and they're even if they are make believe, it's something that we can sit down and we can escape for a couple hours with a movie or twenty minutes in a comic book, and enjoy these stories of these great creations. Um, I just finished watching Daredevil season three, nice. which was a creation of his. Yeah. And, and I could escape for fifty three minutes a night and watch episodes of Daredevil into this world that Stan gave us in this in this character created. And I think that's the absolute legacy that I was I will always remember. Is just thank you, Stan, for giving us these, these characters I love so much and that allow me to escape for anywhere from 10 minutes to a few hours at a time. Yeah, I mean, I, like you said, um, gone but never forgotten. No, absolutely. Gone but never forgotten. And uh, he will always be there. And um, I think that's all we though. I think we've done him tribute by talking about his legacy in the Spider-Man films. And uh, we hope you enjoy listening to it all. Yes. And, um, and go to the RebelRadioPodcast.com where you will find this episode all our other episodes and uh we'll have a new episode out this weekend we'll be talking rocky as our next film Yo. on the podcast and ranking the rocky Bo-boa. movies quite different than spider-man talking rocky yeah <laughs> so that, should, that should be fun but um thank you as always for listening and uh stan man I, you know i saw a meme uh one cool thing note that kevin conroy posted a picture of adam west and stan lee and go man heaven's probably having a hell of a lot of fun right now i (laughs) think that's a very appropriate way to look at it probably Uh, kevin conroy the great voice of batman the animated series yes so uh, as always this is mark this is matt and excelsior Excelsior. hi heroes this is stan lee coming at you want you to know marvel has always been and always will be a reflection of the world right outside our window That world may change and evolve, but the one thing that will never change is the way we tell our stories of heroism. Those stories have room for everyone, regardless of their race, gender, religion, or color of their skin. The only things we don't have room for are hatred, intolerance, and bigotry. That man next to you, he's your brother. That woman over there, she's your sister. And that kid walking by, hey, who knows? He may have the proportionate strength of a spider. We're all part of one big family, the human family, and we all come together in the body of Marvel. And you, you're part of that family. You're part of the Marvel universe that moves ever upward and onward to greater glory. In other words, Excelsior. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. Bye.
Hey, this is Marky Ramon, and you're listening to the Rebel Radio Podcast.